Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Hey, welcome to church today. You guys sound great today. You look great today. I just want to say thank you again for making space for each other. Okay, this, today was the first week someone threatened to sit on my lap. I was so happy. Uh, but one, one chair, okay, one chair between groups, everybody, and shoulder to shoulder if you know them and like them, okay? Uh, also, just I just want to let you know, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't feel super, super tight, but if you walk in, uh, seven minutes late, if you ever, you know, some, you know, okay, some of you, uh, you know, the lights are down, people are standing in, it just looks totally full, and people are like, oh, where do I go, where do I sit? So, you know, sh- shoulder to shoulder, one chair, and if you can move in toward the middle, then people can see those seats, and, the, you know, those people who come late can see uh, uh, open chairs and things like that. But thank you for being here. Take care of each other, welcome each other, learn a name, uh, and just, yeah, thank you. Well, uh, we got space. We're doing just fine. Are we doing okay? Everybody's okay? All right, praise God. Hey, uh, again, if, th- uh, if this is your first time here, by the way, this morning, I know, you know I've met a couple of people already who've walked in. This is their very first Sunday. We just want to say a special welcome to you. We know it takes a lot to walk into a new building like this full of people that you don't know. We really are just honored to have you uh, join us this morning, aren't we, everybody? It's an honor to have you here this morning. And everybody joining us online, we miss you. I was reminded this week uh, why it's so important to have this connection, especially for people facing health challenges. We miss you. We hope that you're doing well. We hope you can join us again soon sometime. Uh, Anyway, we just hope that you're well. Well, as you saw in the bumper video there, uh, we're continuing a series today called He is Greater, which is a walk through the New Testament book of Hebrews. And Hebrews, again, if this is your first time here, you just need to catch up. Hebrews was written about 35 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. And it was written to a second generation of Jewish Christians who were saying that they want to leave Christianity. And they want to leave Christianity and return to the customs and traditions they came out of because Christianity doesn't seem to really be working for them anymore. In fact, allegiance to Jesus is actually creating some of the problems that they're facing. And so the theme of Hebrews is to keep going, to hold fast to Christ. Actually, that's going to be in the very first verse that we'll read together today. Continue holding fast to Jesus because he's greater. If you're wondering what makes Christianity unique, here's the one thing that we have that nobody else has, and that's Jesus. And your heart cannot live without him. Jesus said that he is life. That's one of the things that he claims for himself. And if that's true, if Jesus is life, you cannot live without him. Not now and not in eternity either. The challenge though, the challenge for that second generation of Christians and the challenge for us today is that we cannot see him. Okay, we, or I should say we cannot see him physically any time that we want to. When Christians talk about faith, okay, we are not talking about a blind leap into the dark or into the unknown. Christ, faith, Christian faith, is not about believing in irrational or unreasonable things, but we are talking about things that we can't see. Okay, so for example, the historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus is formidable. It's robust if you would look into it. But I cannot just conjure Jesus up for you any time that I want to, to show you that he's alive. So we are inviting one another to build our lives on reasonable but unseen things. And Hebrews is pleading with one voice, please do not turn away. Just because you cannot see and touch these things, don't turn away to the old customs that you've come out of uh, just because it feels safer because you can see them, okay? So we're gonna pick up right where we left off, Hebrews chapter four, that'll be on page 1003 in a Bible under the chairs in front of you. Page 1003 this morning if you wanna follow along. Same theme this week, but today we're gonna be talking about the priesthood of Jesus. We're gonna talk about how we need a perfect priest, we have a perfect priest, And we're going to talk about God's invitation to each one of us, okay? We need a priest, we have a priest, and God's invitation. Everybody there? Sam there? All right, Hebrews chapter 4. We're going to start in verse 14. Since then we have a great high priest 
who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. As he, as he says also in another place, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. I have one more scripture reading I want to share with you uh, this morning. This is from the prophet Isaiah. This is about 750 years before the birth of Jesus, and the setting uh, is the temple in Jerusalem. This is from Isaiah. This will be on the screen. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. It says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am send me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right, turn over to Hebrews again. Why have I included that reading from Isaiah in our time together this morning? It's because uh, the first verse of our reading today said that Jesus is the divine son of God, our great high priest who has passed through the heavens. What does that mean that Jesus has passed through the heavens? We'll say more about this in a second. But the gist of it is that Jesus is in the immediate presence of God right now. He's in the immediate presence of God. The heavens are the place where God dwells. I don't mean by that that God isn't present everywhere, but the heavens are the place where God's presence is experienced in an unveiled, undiminished, unmitigated sort of way. And Isaiah got just a glimpse of that. And I say just a glimpse because even Isaiah, okay, in his vision, doesn't get any further than saying there's a king, he's on a throne, he's seated, he's got a giant train, and he doesn't go any higher than that. And he said, that's all that he can handle. And I just share that to say, well, you know, we don't think much about that. Okay, we think far too lightly of the presence of God if we think about it at all. We talk about the presence of God as though one day we're going to waltz in there and say, what's up, God? Yeah, I got a few questions for you. How many, how many times have you or you've heard other people say, when I die, I got a lot of questions for God? No, no, you won't. <laughs> no, 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 you will not. I, I'm not saying... I, 
I wasn't even trying to be funny. I'm just, I'm not saying that there won't be answers in heaven, okay? I'm just saying they're not going to come that way. You're going to be in the presence of God and a lot of things will be answered right now. And you'll say, okay, I get it. I saw the Lord, Isaiah says, seated on a throne, high and lifted up. The train of his robe filled the temple. The doorposts and the thresholds of the temple shook in God's presence. And then there are these incredible angelic creatures called seraphim that guard the way into God's presence. They're there to make sure you don't just waltz into God's presence. And they call to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And Isaiah, who is a priest, by the way, okay, please keep that in mind today, who Isaiah who is a priest is almost undone by the experience. He's, he calls down a curse on himself. He says, woe is me. He, he does not say, you know, God, I'm glad you stopped by. I've had, I have a bone I want to pick with you. No, he says, I'm damned. I'm damned. I'm dead. I'm toast. I'm lost. The presence of God is a fearsome and awesome thing. And we need a priest that's why we need a priest. Back to, back to Hebrews. What does a priest do then exactly? Okay, what's his job? Take a look with me at verses one through three. I know that this is about the high, he's talking about the high priest, but this would be true of all priests. Their job, verse one, is to act on behalf of people in relationship to God, it says. So they represent people before God and they offer sacrifices and gifts for us. So what priests did in the ancient and the modern world is offer tangible gifts and sacrifices on our behalf and then they turn to you and say, it's okay, you're gonna be okay. We also see in verse two that they're to deal gently with the ignorant and the wayward because they share in our human frailty or in our weakness. A priest is someone who can put his arm around you and say with integrity, I, I get it, I get it, and I'm sorry. Uh, they can speak an encouraging word because they've been there. A good priest knows how to cry with people, how to sit with people, how to hug people and just be with people because he's been there. And when a priest has to be hard, and sometimes they do have to be hard, they do it from right here, right alongside you. And everyone has them, by the way. Every single person has priests. So if you're thinking, I'm not a first century Jew, I'm not Catholic, I'm not Anglican, I'm a modern, secular, rational person, and my friends and I moved beyond the hocus pocus a long time ago, I would just say, you do. Modern people absolutely have priests, we just don't call them that, we call them counselors, therapists, life coaches, allies, our priests. Your, does anyone have your people? Your people are Priests, it, what, are we, what, what do I mean? Well, I'm just saying every person has to have people in their lives who come alongside to heal us, to fix us, and to help us through our daily suffering. So you may not use the word sin, but you still have people that you turn to to say, it's gonna be okay. I'm with you, and there is hope, and I absolve you, you know, this is what allies do. They, I absolve you of X, Y, and Z, and it's going to be okay. That's a priest. That's what they do. So maybe you're here this morning. You're saying, oh, I see the preachers doing a little word salad today, a little mumbity jumbity with the words, a little Jesus jujitsu, and I'm not buying it because priests are about religion, and I'm not a religious person. I just, I'm, just, I'm not trying to mess with you. I'm just saying, what is the question that all of our counselors, all of our therapists, all of our friends, all of our elves, what is the question that they're answering for us? Am I, am I okay? Am I gonna be okay? And is there hope for my life? Incidentally, you know, in, so in Protestant churches like the one that you're sitting in this morning, the reason that we don't have priests is because we believe, based on First, first Peter 2, Hebrews 7, Revelation 5, and a whole bunch of other places, we believe that every Christian is a priest in some sense. So you're, we actually like super believe in them. You're surrounded by them right now and you have them. 
They're there to come alongside you. They're part of God's gift to you. They heal us. They help fix us. They're the, they're the flesh and blood people that put their arm around us and say, it's going to be okay. The problem is that our priests, modern and ancient alike, are just not enough. Even the very best ones. Your best friends, your closest allies, the most faithful people are just not enough because, verse 3, they have their own issues to deal with. Okay, they, they're working through their own stuff and they can't actually heal us. They can make you feel better, but in the end, at, at, in the hour of your death, they cannot save you. They cannot prevent that from happening and they cannot actually make your soul okay. We need a perfect priest. That's the word that Hebrews uses. We need a perfect priest, and we have that. So second question, what makes Jesus a perfect priest? Let's just look at what this teaches about Jesus. Take a look at verse 14. Uh, first of all, Jesus is perfect because he is transcendent and powerful. We have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. It's interesting, isn't it, that it doesn't say we have a great high priest who's in the heavens. That would be totally true, by the way. But Hebrews goes just a little further to say that Jesus has passed through the heavens. Now, okay, we're going to, this, you know, we're, who's ready for some metaphysical speculation this morning? Are you excited? So I'm speculating, but just based on my understanding of the scriptures and the things that we read about heaven, it's huge. It's an immense place. The heavens are gigantic and full. Okay, it's just a giant place. So when it says that Jesus has passed through the heavens, I just get this image in my mind of like a meteor that shoots across the sky. And the, the point is, okay, now I'm not speculating anymore. Is everybody done with the speculating? But this is, this is what it's teaching. It's just saying Jesus has passed through the heavens to the very center the very center of reality. He's at the very center. Every time we get a glimpse of heaven in the Bible, Jesus is at the center of everything going on. He's in the, he's in the middle of the white hot glory of God. We just sang, he's worthy. You know, he is the, the focus of attention and praise. Behind the temptation to leave Christ is either a terrible misunderstanding about who he is or a lack of reflection on this. What would you give up in place of Jesus if this is who he is? I mean, if you were offered all the wealth of this world, all position and power, romantic relationships, a sense of belonging, all honor and, and a long life, if you were offered all of these things to give up Jesus, that would be a lousy deal. When we say that Christianity just isn't working for us, there has to be some disconnect with this reality. Jesus is the Son of God who's passed through the heavens and is at the very center. And no other priest can say that. He alone is transcendent and powerful. Second, we see that he's tender and personal. Look at verse, <clears throat> excuse me, verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, but without sin. So this theme came up back in chapter 2, verses 17 and 18, to just a, a review from a few weeks ago. Part of what makes Jesus perfect is that he's put on a nature like ours. We said a few weeks ago, a human being, Adam, created this mess and has plunged all of creation into death. And so justice demands that the blood of another Adam heal all of this. The, the blood of Adam runs in Jesus' veins. So it's, only, it's just, or the word from a few weeks ago was, it's fitting that he had to genuinely become like us and to suffer, just, just the way that a priest has to put on certain you know, vestments and garments and then he has to wash himself and prepare himself so that he can do his job. In the same way, Jesus has put on a nature like ours and suffered to make himself fit to be 
a sacrifice on our behalf. So Jesus is a perfect priest because he knows the frailties and groaning of human life. We had a good laugh together a few weeks ago over whether Jesus empathizes with us or sympathizes with the, or, or whether Tim Prince knows how to talk good English or not. If you remember this. Whatever, okay, whatever the English word is in verse 2, the Greek word means to co-suffer. To co-suffer. No other religion dares to say that about God. Jesus co-suffers with us because, verse, uh, verse 15 he, in every respect, he's been tempted as we are, but without sin. So he, he knows he's a perfect priest because he knows he has experienced the full range of temptation, yet never once gave into its power. So if you're, if you're, tempted, to, to, if you're tempted to feel hopeless, Okay, Jesus knows what that temptation is like. If you're tempted to, to give up, to give into anger, he's been tempted by that. If you're tempted to control, to be critical, to complain, to please people, if you're ever afraid of what people think of you, Jesus was tempted by those things as well, but never surrendered to them. So in every respect, he was tempted, yet never gave into that. So he knows what it's like. He suffers with the sufferers, and shows us the way through. Tom Schreiner puts it this way, he says, what we need is not a fellow loser, but a winner. Not one who shares in our defeat, but who's able to lead us to victory. Not a sinner, but a savior. He's perfect. We can add verse two to this. Jesus can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward. So if he's the perfect priest, he must do the things that priests do perfectly, and he does. That, that particular, we're not going to do a ton of Greek, okay? That, just that particular Greek word means to, uh, it has the sense of restraining or moderating suffering. You ever, have you ever seen a child go to his mother and the way that she talks to him, you know, she puts pressure on the wound to soothe, brushes the hair out of his eyes, wipes his tears, speaks to him softly. That's the word. Jesus is able to deal gently with us, with the wayward and the ignorant. He's our great high priest. And by the way, what elicits that response from Jesus has nothing to do with your sin. The severity or the uh, not severity of your sin has nothing to do with his response. It is the fact that you come it's the fact that you come to Jesus that elicits that tenderness. He, he has a heart that simply cannot turn away from the sinner who comes needing help. Dane Ortland uh, puts it this way. He says, contrary to what we expect to be the case, the deeper into weakness and suffering and testing that we go. Is anyone here dealing with weakness, suffering or testing? Life is not working. The deeper we go, the deeper Christ goes with us. As we go down into pain and anguish, we are descending ever deeper into Christ's heart, not away from it. Let me say that again. As we, as we go down into pain and anguish, we are descending deeper into Christ's heart, not away from it. And that's awesome. Are you descending into pain and anguish, hopelessness, fear, uncertainty? Are you grieving great sin? Are you grieving great loss? Have you done the unthinkable? Have you become what you thought you would never become? Jesus is a perfect priest. And if you would just come, he will go with you. He is transcendent and powerful. He's tender and personal. Third, we see in the scripture here that he's, uh, he's royal and eternal. Uh, take a look at verses five and six. Okay, so here we learn that Jesus is a perfect priest because he's from a different order. Okay, you ask any first century Jew, who's the greatest priest of all time? Nine out of 10 or 10 out of 10 would say Aaron. He's mentioned there in verse four, Aaron's the greatest. He was the first, you know, just by virtue of his preeminence, he's the greatest priest. And Hebrews is just saying he, he is great. He's amazing. But Jesus is like from a whole other order. 
And he calls it the order of Melchizedek. Well, who in, who's Melchizedek? We'll, get, we'll actually get to that in chapter 7. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on that today. Uh, but here's what you need to see today. Verse 5 says, So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by God who said to him, and then he quotes from Psalm 2. He says, you are my son, today I have begotten you. The thing is that Psalm 2 has nothing to do with a priest. It's about the king. It's, it's, it's a royal psalm. It's kind of the royal psalm. This is the coronation psalm of Israel. And then in verse 6 he says, as he says also in another place, and then he quotes from Psalm 110, where David says, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Here's all you need to know today is that Melchizedek is the only person in the Bible who was both priest and king. Nobody else does that. Uh, well, I should, So Adam was a royal priest as well, but he lost his position because of sin. So really, there's Jesus and Melchizedek, the only people in the Bible who hold both of these offices. And actually, in the ancient world, like, I, I, don't, I don't think anybody does this. I, I don't know the ancient world exhaustively, but I've never heard of any other king also being priest over his nation or, or vice versa. Who cares? You care, believe me. It is, it is not enough to have a great high priest, even one that would co-suffer with you, even one that has passed through the heavens is not enough. We need a king who will make things right. A priest is meant to come alongside you, put his arm around you, to comfort you and sit with you. A king lives to make things right. He enforces justice and righteousness. Kings uh, go to war for their people. Priests exist to, he to heal people. Kings exist to heal the world. And Jesus is perfect because he doesn't just sit with us. He can say with integrity, I'm going to fix this and make it right. John chapter 11 is one place where we see these two offices in the life of Jesus. In John chapter 11, one of Jesus' good friends, a man named Lazarus, dies. And Jesus goes to be with the family. And when the sisters come to him, uh, what does Jesus do? He weeps, okay, he weeps. He sits and he cries with them, he co-suffers with them, he feels their pain. And then he turns to the tomb in anger. And with a voice of command, he says, Lazarus, come out, and he does. If, if Jesus only cared about our tears, we would feel better for a while, we would have comfort for a while, but ultimately, there is no hope. If he were only a king and only cared about righteousness and justice, praise be to God, but what happens to you and me? We have a perfect priest who can do both because only he is both. He's the only priest who can put his arm around you and with integrity say to you, I am going to fix this forever. Verse seven says, speaking of Jesus and his priesthood, says in the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with, with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and he was heard because of his reverence. Remember the original recipients of this letter, as many, like many of us, were experiencing pain and they were thinking of leaving Christianity because it just wasn't working anymore. And Hebrews is saying, please don't do that. Please don't do that. Your, your priest knows. He knows. And throughout his life, he was a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. Climaxing on the eve of his death in the Garden of Gethsemane where he cried out to God with anguished tears that God would deliver him from death. Jesus is a perfect high priest because he's better than you. He's just better than us. Okay, he's better than all your earth, this worldly priests. His reverence, his, 
goodness ensured that God heard his plea. But it says here that he was saved from death. How, does, how can that be? He died. It's talking about his resurrection here. God answered the cries of our priest not by saving him from death, but actually by plunging him into it on our behalf and bringing him through to glory. And now Jesus can say with integrity, I have done all that needs to be done to heal the world, to heal you. And it may feel like you're being plunged into death right now. I will, first of all, I will go with you. And secondly, I will raise you from the dead. Please, Hebrews says, please do not leave a priest like this. So here's the invitation that God gives to everyone. Since then we, this is verse 16, since then we have a great high priest who's passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Where is the throne of grace? What is that? It's, it's the throne of God. It's the throne that we read about in Isaiah chapter 6 this morning. That's the throne that he's talking about. You mean the one with the king that's high and lifted up and the train of his robe fills the temple, the one guarded by the mighty angelic creatures that can kill me? That, that one? That one. The invitation is come in because you have a great high priest seated on that throne. You mean I, you mean I do get to just waltz in to God's? I wouldn't say waltz in. No, I, I wouldn't waltz in. But you are, you are asked to come. This is more than an invitation. I'm going to go ahead and say this is a command. God wants you to come in and, and, to, and to, to be with him, to bring your concerns, your weakness, your trial, your hardship, come in. And the promise is you'll, what you'll find there is mercy and grace to help in time of need. What does it mean to draw near to a throne like that? It's just talking about prayer and worship. It's not super complicated. This isn't rocket science day at Faith Community Church. It's just talking about prayer and worship. Hebrews is inviting you to draw near in prayer and worship. Come to the throne. If you're saying, well, I'm not really sure I believe I can do that, I would say, that's why you don't pray. Or that's why you don't look forward to time in prayer. Weakness in prayer or a lack of interest in prayer, a, you know, a lack of interest in gathering with the congregation for worship and so on, there has to be a misunderstanding of one of these things. Either we do not see the throne of God in Isaiah 6 as we should, and so we're bored, or we think, I, I'm just not, you know, I have, I've prayed, I've tried praying, kind of bounces off the ceiling and comes back to me. I'm not really sure that God can help. I just say, that's, that's, act, that's unbelief. Hear the word of the Lord this morning and draw near. Or, on the other hand, we see the throne of God. We have this exalted vision of God, but we think, I, I cannot, I'm unworthy, I'm dirty, I'm ashamed, I would, he's, he's gonna kill me, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You're not hearing at Hebrews 4 and 5. He, he wants you to come with confidence to the throne of grace. We, uh, we've talked, you know, a lot in this series about unbelief. Unbelief is hearing the word of God and then saying, I just don't think I can believe that and turning away. Okay, it's case study day. Will you hear Isaiah 6 and Hebrews 4 and 5 at the same time and say, I don't understand maybe how this works, but I believe, and I'm going to come. 
I'm going to come because Jesus has called me. For everyone that is overwhelmed this morning, come in faith to the throne of grace. For everyone that's fearful and timid, what made Isaiah so bold for so many years? He'd been in the presence of God. To the hurting and the lonely, to those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for those who are tired of the world, for those who are tired of themselves, come this morning to the throne of grace. If you are afraid of your past, if you're afraid of what the future holds for you, you've gotten some terrible diagnosis recently, come to the throne of grace. It is hard to stay afraid when you've been in the presence of God. It's hard to remain timid or overwhelmed or self-centered or whatever the issue is when you've been in the presence of God. So let me read this from a man named Samuel right out. And what we're going to do this morning is we're going to sing a hymn together that talks about the priesthood of Jesus. And then we'll share communion uh, after that song. But hear this from Samuel right out. He says, Who can touch Jesus now? Can death say aught to him? He has been down into death and through it, it could not hold him. Can Satan lay his unclean hands upon him? Satan has had his say and found nothing in him. All his malice and hatred have been vented upon him. He has suffered for sin and put it away. The storm is gone forever and he is the author of eternal salvation. Who shall say to Jesus, no, as he opens his arms wide and gathers in the unclean and the unworthy and the guilty? Who shall say to him, no, as he draws them to himself and says, heaven is open for you and I will lead you into the presence of my, of God, of my God and Father with exceeding joy? Who would dare lay a hand upon one soul and say, this one shall not go with you. This one does not deserve to enter here. He has gone on high a high priest forever with all the dignity and glory connected with that title, with all the blessed power of salvation suggested in it for us. O oh, beloved, he is the author of eternal salvation. Bless his name for all who have bowed in heart to him. Let's stand and sing and we'll share communion uh, when we're finished.